Now, um, higher education research, folks, is about people. It's about what people do, and it's about those people themselves. It's about people who want to create knowledge, who want to write papers and express themselves that way, who want to work with others in creating knowledge, want to have conversations about creating knowledge, and in the process of creating knowledge. I mean, everyone here, everyone attending this conference, without exception, can contribute to this process. You don't have to have project funding to conduct research or to write scholarship-based papers. And often, though, those conceptual papers that don't run through an empirical loop um, uh, have an influence. But most research is empirical, and when it requires significant data collection, funding does become necessary. Um, and I think that everyone here knows, knows that funding's important, and there are people in this room who have expertise in gathering funding, who have experienced in the different funding schemes available in different places, and can assist others in that process. Um, but, so what I'm saying is that there's no real reason not to contribute if you want to. Um, but it's also, I think, higher education research is also about um, people who have a long-term commitment to it, you know, who, who, who sustain uh, a presence and activity in the field over, over decades or over, so certainly over more than a, a project or two. Uh, even if they do other things, even if their work is partly about other things, they can come back to higher education research from time to time, do significant project work and, and so on in, in this field. And I think that at CG, one of our tasks was to, has been, is still, to create or help to create or help to support the creation of, provide conditions for a further generation of higher education researchers. And we were fortunate in the sense that we had a program structure, a pro set of projects which allowed us to hire people into those projects to work on them. And those people, of course, have been, as always, very instrumental in what's come out at the other end. So we've had this engagement with people in the first 15 to 30% of their careers, you know, if you include the, the, the doctorate as part of the career. So that, that immediately post-graduation and into the first few years. And um, four of those people are on this panel. Um, I guess we hope that some or all of them will continue to retain an engagement with higher education topics, continue to contribute to higher education research in working on the existing policy problems, um, conducting fundamental inquiries, develop, 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 developing our insights into what's distinctive about the higher education and tertiary education knowledge and research sectors, um, as, as, as Bob Clark said, uh, what the distinctive dynamics, the things that can't be explained with models drawn from other sectors of, of this society and economy. So with me have Four people. Aline Courtois is a senior lecturer in the Department of Education at the University of Bath, and she holds a PhD in, so in sociology from University College Dublin and Paris One Pantheon Sorbonne, and worked on our public good project with great distinction until she went to Bath. Um, Janja Komoljenovic is a senior lecturer at Lancaster University, where her research focuses on the political economy of, great, of higher education and the digitalisation, datification and platformization of universities. Very innovative researcher. We follow her work with great interest. And she is on her way, I think, to Edinburgh. Um, so, so Lancaster is not her last, um, last career stop. She will have another one after this. Um, and Yanya, of course, began in, to, through doing um, distinguished work with Paul Ashwin on the first, of our, uh, the first listed of our projects on student learning. In, 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 in uh, chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, Lee Ransomer is a lecturer at IOE's UCL's Faculty of Education and Society and a CG research fellow on project number nine still, um, mapping su superannuation, sorry, superannuation, supernational <laughs> higher education space. And Lee has produced a steady stream of important work if coming from that project. Um, and Finally, on my left, Shin Shu is a department lecturer in higher and tertiary education at the University of Oxford, and she works on higher education, tertiary education at quite a general level, but she's specifically working on, um, on research on research, 
where she's been has has served as the distinguished um, postdoc in that project. But you'll notice one thing that all these people have in common: senior lecturer, senior lecturer, lecturer, lecturer. They've all been promoted into academic posts during their time or from their time with CG, and that, that's something we're very proud of because these are four really good researchers, and it's great to see them having some opportunity to uh, to go on, uh, which they all want to do. Um, one of the best things about academic life is the commitment people have to academic life, you know, and 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 doing the sort of things that we do, seeing it as worthwhile, and finding it fulfilling personally um, in that process. So we're going to take them in the order I've just read out, which is, begins with Aline. Each person will speak for 10 minutes. I'll be waving the two-minute timetable thing around if I don't fall asleep and lose count, and um, and uh, and then we'll have some discussion. So Aline. Okay, well, thank you very much, Simon, for this very nice uh, introduction, even though you, you covered some of the stuff I was going to say, but <laughs> that's all right. So uh, thank you, thank you everyone for uh, making this a really, really great day so far. So it's gr always great to catch up with the projects and people connected to, uh, to the center. So uh, Simon asked us today to talk about future research on higher education, and I know that my colleagues are going to introduce very exciting research agendas. Um, I thought I would twist the question a little. So instead of focusing on future research on higher ed education, I'd like to talk a little bit about the future of higher education research and researchers. So uh, anyone who knows my work or, or who has ever spoken to me is probably now thinking, right, she's going to talk about precarity, isn't she? And indeed I am, but not <laughs> just about that. So yes, academic precarity, casualization, it is my research of, or one of the strengths in my research, but it's also uh, very important. And I'm thinking back of an event I attended over 10 years ago. It was the launch of a campaign to defend the university. That's how it was called. And I remember then uh, saying, well, okay, it's all very nice, but you know, if you don't address the issue of casualization, at some point, there is not gonna be very much to defend and not many people left to defend it either, okay? So there's no academic freedom really when you're hourly paid or, or unemployed. But uh, without necessarily being that pessimistic, I think it's an important uh, issue and something that we need to think about. It's inseparable as well from the research agendas that uh, we are building in higher education and also, um, and also elsewhere. So, Casualization, this said, is not the only thing, um, I think for two main reasons. Firstly, it's not necessarily an adequate framework to look at uh, some regions in the world. Um, uh, and secondly, because it's also imbricated in other uh, phenomena. So yes, not really necessarily the best framework because uh, it's kind of Western, I suppose, and precarity and casualization do not adequately describe situations in other higher education systems necessarily, where other forms of precarity might be more salient than you know, employment precarity, which is how academic precarity tends to be understood, um, where other intersections would matter a lot more, and also where you know, other forms of academic work exist, or even you know, different models of higher education where those questions are you know, not really um, not really relevant. And I think there's actually quite an interesting research agenda there uh, in terms of higher education research, you know, and how can we research academic systems, academic work uh, in the global south, for example, without a Western lens, and how can we, how can that research also be conducted without reproducing problematic labor relations? So how can we do research on global inequality in higher education, on precarity and exploitation, without producing more um, inequality and precarity and exploitation in the mm -hmm. process? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a methodological and research question at the same time. Uh, okay, so the, the, the other reason why I don't want to talk strictly about casualization is because, as I said, it's also deeply imbricated with other issues that we have encountered in our, in our research and that some of the speakers today have already uh, covered quite extensively. So one of those things is that research on higher education, as, as it reaches us in you know, English-speaking main journals, tends to be concentrated on global North countries. And when it looks at the global South, it tends to be the kind of you know, higher income, upper middle income countries within that. 
Um, but there's also excellent research which is not in English and which is therefore not really uh, visible to us. It may be in other disciplines as well, because in some countries, like, you know, it's higher education is not really a defined field. There's not really like a journal with it or a society with it. So it could be in geography, it could be in migration studies, for example, and we may not actually meet those people. Um, and I know that Bruce McFarlane had, you know, designed a map of higher education research with all those different islands. And I think there's more than that, actually, that are not even on the map because uh, we don't necessarily think of those areas of research as, as higher education, even though they are. But so this has to do, of course, with the structure of the field of higher education studies and how it came to be. And a lot of researchers have explored that. And our colleagues who do bibliometrics uh, would, would have a lot, lot more to say about that as well. But it also has to do to some extent to the uh, working conditions and the structure of opp to opportunity, of professional opportunity for researchers and early career researchers in different places as well. And these obviously are shaped by even broader structural uh, issues that, again, some speakers have, have spoken about very eloquently today. But I'm just, just, just a very brief example from a, a wealthy Western country not far from here, namely France, that uh, where I know the situation a little bit, bit there, but for example, you have in France 10 times more new PhDs per year than there are new uh, positions in academia, 10 times more, okay? And uh, higher education, um, I mean, there are researchers in higher education, but the few posts that appear every year in fields like sociology or education, I've never seen one that had higher education in the heading. They're usually quite clearly defined. Uh, so it's not really a thing. And that's an issue in France in particular, because when you apply for a job, you have to send your PhD dissertation with your application. So if you have researched higher education as part of your PhD research, it may not actually get you very far. Okay, and that's a huge issue because there's brilliant research being conducted there, but not many places for those researchers um, to go. Um, and also it means that I think, it means that potentially we miss out on research that is produced in French. So I'm thinking again about international higher education, the whole field of South to South uh, student migration and ac academic migration. There's actually quite a lot uh, about that um, about in French. And sometimes it's conducted, from, uh, it's conducted by researchers from those countries who have moved to France. But if they are to make a career in France, they have to publish in French. So then, you know, they're not, uh, they're not visible. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, visible here. So back to the issue of casualization and the UK. Um, I think there are a number of issues that we need to think about. And Simon mentioned, uh, okay, our involvement in the center and uh, where it led us, and indeed, I think there are a lot of uh, higher education researchers, potential higher education researchers, who rely on places like CGHE, who rely on uh, established researchers to get funding, okay, just to employ us, right? And it's quite unclear how that's going to develop in the future. And I'm thinking of a few things that I see, so there seems to be in recent years, some pressure, either from funding bodies or from universities, um, you know, finance in universities to kind of reduce the duration of posts of people employed to work on grants, to favor part-time research assistants rather than, you know, uh, longer postdocs, uh, to also reduce the time of, you know, researchers, even those in permanent roles, to work on those projects. So that's uh, an issue. Um, in some places, I'm hearing stories of people who left a postdoc and find that they can no longer access the data that they collected because of data management, you know, um, uh, legal issues. So that also uh, a huge hurdle because it me means they're really kind of limited to a role of data collection and then they can't really uh, publish anymore, not through legal channels anyway. And there's also the issue of teaching only contracts, which are not so much in many cases a stepping stone, but rather risk, you know, entrenching precarity uh, for people who, who take them. And I mean, no time to get into that, but there's a whole question of who gets the jobs when there are jobs. And we know from extensive research in the area that there's still tendency for, you know, white Western uh, researchers to be favored for, for positions. So, 
all of that leads to a big question. It's, you know, how do we build research agendas on higher education within the current environment that is uh, sustainable, that is truly international, that builds bridges with research that is done elsewhere, maybe in different languages, maybe in different disciplines? How do we build partnerships that are not uh, exploitative within these constraints? And how do we create, at the same time, good working conditions and career paths for higher education researchers here and elsewhere? That's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. So, um, thank you very much, Simon, for the kind introduction, and indeed to all of you for making this such a productive day, and for persisting with us for this uh, last panel. Um, so, I will start with, uh, with a short anecdote. The other night, um, I was at a dinner with a couple of friends who happened to be academics, and the discussion led us to chat GPT and um, technology. And one of them got really panicky and started saying, you know, chat GPT is going to run us out of our jobs, uh, there are going to be AI assistants, people will start uh, learning through, through this technology. And the other one said, we should relax, you know, it's just a current hype. And surely universities serve a bigger purpose um, than that. But emotions were high, you know, people get scared, what is happening? Um, and I think that these two views are actually quite representative of what we can think of theoretically. Two approaches on views on technological or AI risk um, to our societies, where one is decisive, where we can see sort of immediate disruption of the way how we do things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is accumulative, where you sort of have a, a series of incremental changes that then lead to a bigger change. So I want to address here what these views mean for the future of higher education and higher education research, um, and just how we can think through this. So I will obviously focus on educational technology or ed tech, um, and technology in general that we find in education. Um, so, you know, the likes of Microsoft 365, Teams, you know, you all um, know that, or virtual learning environments, various management platforms, Pure, and so on. Um, so I'm not talking about um, MOOCs or online uh, delivery that was discussed before. Um, universities are thoroughly digitalized, and quite a lot of that is through uh, proprietary platforms. So for example, a representative British university has more than 150 contracts with vendors who supply various software and digital products, okay? Um, so that's quite a lot. Um, I, I will not have a structured input here, but rather I will sort of provide some food for thought and discussion about this being the object of research as well as our working condition uh, of us as higher education researchers. Um, so while there's a lot already, lots and lots of research on technology, just to give an example, technology enhanced learning is a long time established field. Um, I think that we lack a more macro level uh, substantive debate um, on how we want technology to support the sector as a whole in the totality of its emergence, and also the consideration of underlying impact. So there's increasing cost of digital technology for universities, uh, new jobs that are needed to support this digital infrastructure, such as cloud engineers, vendor managers, um, learning technologies, data scientists, and how does this then all translate into our everyday practices of students and academics. And if we think of this digital, uh, the digital, I would argue that it's more macro level, uh, political economic view, uh, where the future of higher education research can support the sector and the policymakers to actually address the more fundamental trends, governance models and processes, and also impact and stir the future direction. Um, I will address only two key points, although I could speak for hours about this, um, but in the interest of, of um, keeping uh, time for discussion and questions. So first around data 
collected on and from students and staff, um, including uh, user data. So when we engage with different platforms, you know, platforms have the ability to collect and store and process of what we do, what we click, how long we stay there. And the promise is that this data will help us with institutional efficiency and, and personalization of learning. Um, universities are offered various analytics um, metrics, such as learning analytics supposedly being a proxy for learning, or accessing digital applications being a proxy for student engagement. But we haven't really discussed as a sector um, the incredibly high risk of data aggregation and data production uh, on individuals at a very granular, granular level, such as surveillance that can happen at very individual or class level, institutional level, national levels, or even at a company for for-profit interest. Just think about you know, national uh, um, level and potential of um, surveilling students for immigration purposes or institutions surveilling staff uh, for new ways of kind of monitoring of uh, work satisfaction and so on. Um, and then there's the question, is, is the risk worth it in consideration of potential benefits, especially if proxies are not really measuring what they're supposed to measure. So how can we actually develop frameworks that would support universities in innovating uh, with technology and with digital data in a way that we want and that is helpful and productive rather than what is pushed onto the sector from the outside? Um, and most importantly, if user-generated data uh, is a common good, so we all produce it together, um, do we have the opportunity to actually contribute to the collective and de democratic decision making of what happens with it? Um, so data privacy regulation is not enough here. Um, so in other words, how can we make sure that we make good and fair decisions uh, that are also participative and collective? Um, and the second point I want to make is concerning the role of university in the society, I'm quite happy that we addressed that several times today, starting, with Simon, with your excellent talk in the morning. Uh, but in relation to technology, um, the future imaginaries of higher education in relation to technology are mostly driven by popular discourse or, or discourse coming from big tech or even ed tech. You know, and the ideas are quite typical here, like digital disruption will challenge the way we do things or universities altogether or, you know, predictive analytics is going to impact uh, learning trajectories, AI and personalization of learning and so on. And while technology can be truly supportive and useful, um, a lot of business models are actually, that are currently already present in the sector, uh, are actually extractive and some people would say even exploitative. So at the moment, um, I think we are very good in studying and worrying about immediate effects on micro levels, you know, just if we think about, you know, currently hot topic chat GPT, there's a lot of thinking through about how we can use that for assignment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we are less good in thinking through uh, the technological innovation from a more macro and political economic perspective. So who controls the data? What are the current and future monetization models? Who profits? Who loses? Who gets to innovate? And so on. Um, and who is, in fact, um, driving the vision of the future of higher education uh, in relation to tech. So I think someone mentioned already today that um, universities are not so good in expressing our own contribution and our own future, and I would argue that here as well. Um, that while we do have these future imaginaries coming mainly from the industry, universities are not so good at expressing their vision of the future and the role of technology in it and actually taking the time to examine the potential use cases that would be um, more socially just and produ productive. So technological change together with other big challenges and wicked problems that my colleagues are addressing here, um, so everything about um, um, increasing inequalities and challenges of social justice, extreme right and populist movements around the world, rising precarious working conditions, all of these together demand a continuous and serious debate on what we want our higher education systems to be, um, who do we want them to serve and how. 
So it might sound like a cliche to come yet again to a conclusion that we need to discuss the role of universities in our societies, but can we do that in, in a more innovative and better and more engaging way in the saying, yes, we serve employability, yes, we serve personal growth. Um, you know, how can we contribute to think through this in a fundamental and continuously challenging political, social, and cultural questions that higher education research needs to address? And I think this is the question we will never be able to truly answer once and for all. But through these changing, challenging conditions, we continuously need to uh, readdress this. And um, you know, Simon and Paul had had um, similar points before. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually follow on in the same way that Yanya started her talk, just by saying thank you to Simon for the kind introduction and for this opportunity today. And thank you to all of you for sticking around. It's half five. Um, lovely to see you all still here. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> right. Um, so just the areas that we're all setting out here today um, are, are broad and, and transversal research areas that can be applied to um, well, not just our work, but m much of yours as well. And so the agenda I'd like to lay out is similarly broad and, and cross-cutting, and that is the, what we've kind of already touched on quite a lot, uh, certainly in Simon's keynote, around the rising focus on geopolitics, and in particular, the geopolitics in and of higher, global higher education. Um, so to be clear, I'm not suggesting that this is a necessarily new direction, um, but that in an increasingly multipolar and polarizing world system, and one where resurgent nationalism has upended decades of the internationalist uh, global order, we're all called to consider new framings, new actors, new terminology in our international research as the context of our research uh, has changed significantly. Hannah Moskowitz and M Emma Sabzalieva uh, recently published an article in, uh, on the new geopolitics of higher education uh, in globalization societies and education, um, and they, they called attention to this emerging field observing that much of the existing work on the geopolitics of higher education articulates geopolitics as context or background to, the, to research rather than the subject or, or the analytical process thereof. And I think this is a useful distinction, um, partly as a call to sharpen our analyses of uh, what we mean by geopolitics, um, which was their intent, but also as a moment for all of us in global higher education research to reflect on how much has actually changed in national and global politics in what feels like a relatively short period of time. And the importance of these changes, whether we, we treat them as context or subject in our work, uh, in prompting new relational ways of thinking, as well as thinking through new interests, new um, power relations, and inevitably new inequalities at various scales. So maybe um, further to Moskowitz and Sabzalieva's point was that the term geopolitics is frequently deployed, but with wide variation in scope uh, or implication, um, perhaps by conflating uh, foreign policy, international relations, peace and conflict studies, um, political uh, ge geographies, among others, under this umbrella of geopolitics. And on one hand, this is really problematic, right? Is it useful to apply that same term uh, to topics as vastly different uh, in scope and temporality as the dominance of certain forms of transnational education and mobility pipelines uh, in a, in a post-colonial world. Um, the Cold War-esque uh, arms race between China and the US for scientific dominance and research production um, in, in, in universities. Um, and, uh, and as well, foreign policy flashpoints uh, with implications for higher education like the Russia-Ukraine conflict and its impact on higher education in Europe, or uh, the fallout of Western international branch campuses in the Middle East um, following the, the, the rel relentless bombardment of the Gaza Strip uh, by Israel. So these are all understood in very varying ways as geopolitical or having geopolitical implications for higher education despite their significantly different starting points. And, and rising nationalism, of course, is also implicated here. Uh, as its reorientation away from the internationalism that has driven the economic and political orientations of nation states in previous decades means changing practices and, and, and changing rationales in higher education 
internationalization. And so this has given prominence to new forms of, of international student recruitment, uh, international scholarships, um, research traineeships, um, as well as uh, how and on what terms countries participate in international higher education initiatives that aren't explicitly self-interested. Um, and so these changes with, with varying scale can be described as having geopolitical ripples or leading to geopolitical transformations. Now I'm, I'm partial to this term. I think it captures all of my own research areas uh, in some form or another. But also its, its disparateness allows me to see commonalities across all of my, my work and in various ways, much, much of the work of all of us here. Um, I might just highlight some of the findings from two of the Project 9 strands that I've been working on um, over the past several years. Um, in my work with Tristan McCohen on the international flows of finance and support to higher education, we continually found a changing landscape of international donors and forms of support. And many of these emerging practices were found to be implicitly or, or often explicitly orientated towards the national interests of donors and having geopolitical implications. So take, for example, um, the preponderance of international scholarship aid for study in the donor country. Um, we found that the majority of global bilateral aid earmarked for higher education goes to exactly this, to, to scholarships. Regardless of whether the donor is a longstanding uh, OECD member, whether it's um, you know, part of the so-called BRICS or, or a wealthy Gulf uh, state. And the benefits, of course, of such aid unquestionably serve national, economic, cultural, and diplomatic interests. Um, we similarly looked at um, major ODA-funded research vehicles, like the UK's Grand Challenges Research Fund, finding that most of the funding supports UK universities, um, both directly, of course, and indirectly, through increasing their research output and, and um, global competitiveness. And so these findings put together uh, affirm what Maudsley et al. in 2018 argue uh, is that foreign aid in a what they call retro-liberal era is effectively an export of economic stimulus, uh, which is driven widely by reconfigurations of geopolitical power and, and changing geoeconomics following the 2007 global financial crisis. And so I should just point out though that, that Tristan and I didn't set out to examine these particular practices, but these led to themes that we inevitably kept finding ourselves returning to the more we investigated the higher education funding landscape, reflecting the, the geopolitical context of current practices uh, in international aid and significance of geopolitics as a focal or analytical frame for, for making sense of these practices. Um, similarly, in my Project 9 work with, with Rachel Brooks on the European higher education space, we were constantly confronted by the tensions between internationalizing or regionalizing processes like the European Universities Initiative and the nationalist political orientations uh, within European member states. And so students and policymakers whom we, we had interviewed commented often uh, on the broader implications for the region as a cohesive bloc and in relation to other regions and other higher education powers. <laughs> And they drew connections, of course, between Brexit, the authoritarian right in Hungary and Poland, um, the rightward lurch in the Netherlands and, and Denmark, and border politics, uh, including the conflict raging uh, on Europe's eastern periphery. So as they tried to make sense of these developments, so, so too did we, invariably through this geopolitical lens. And this approach was really generative for us, as it called on us to consider the geopolitical agency of universities and related higher education organizations. Um, so in one of our forthcoming outputs, uh, we look at various higher education actors' stated positions on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, finding in some cases an incongruence between universities and their national governments on specific foreign policy positions, such as the blanket ban on uh, Russian or Belarusian students and academics, or the discontinuation of publicly funded research with, um, with Russian entities. And so I think this notion of geopolitical agency is really is relevant to what many of us here work on. And it encourages us to rethink what is often posed as a one-way relationship between national governments and universities or national governments and international students. Um, 
and, and it encourages us to see them as agential rather than pawns of national government. Um, and, and so we consider the extent of the, their agency in our analysis. So just to return to something I, I said at the outset, um, whether this constitutes a necessarily new direction in global higher education, uh, in and of itself, no. Right? What, the term geopolitics is broadly applied to capture all manner of international political phenomena um, that has a ripple effect on global power relations. And we could look to probably any decade uh, and find and, and point to it, right? <clears throat> um, but as far as concerns a future research agenda, I've argued here, as, as Simon had earlier, that the current global context has changed so dramatically just in the last decade, the lifespan of CG, um, that we're now called to consider the geopolitical dimensions of higher education in some form. Um, and, and that's perhaps, it's more a matter of how explicit we choose to be in our work about this um, and in our analyses. So if I could just actually uh, take an opportunity to, to, to uh, plug our, and signpost our, our, our upcoming uh, event. Yes. Um, this, uh, we, our Project 9 final event, if you're interested in, in geopolitics, is exactly on the topic. And um, uh, it's rethinking the geopolitics of higher education. Um, it's a day-long symposium, and it will feature new work and thinking um, on, on these issues and contexts. Um, so the event is on the 25th of March. It's a Monday uh, here at the IOE. So hope to see you all there. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Simon, for the kind introduction, and thank you to my colleagues on the panel for the excellent sharing, and also thank you everyone for staying with us. Um, I would like to start with some acknowledgement that this topic is really challenging, the future research on higher education. It's challenging because the future has different features. The future is unpredictable, it's always changing, it's a canvas that is always being repented, and secondly, the future is something that is um, perceived differently by different people. So what I'm going to share is my own vision <laughs> and own reflections based on my own re experiences, which may not map against everyone's uh, envisioned future of higher education studies. And finally, the future is also the present. So what we are doing today also shape the future if what we've shared today will be having a tiny bit of changes to our future, I do hope that the changes will be for the good, better futures. And with all these caveats, um, I would like to start my talk with a focus on the issues revolving around equity and justice within higher education. And I've got two major uh, observed trends. One is about differences, divergence, and intersectionality. And the second is about commonality, dehumanization, and rehumanization. So I'll go through the two points one by one. So the first point is about differences and divergence. When we look at the studies and research about issues of inequity, injustice in higher education at individual level, institutional level, global national levels, there has been increasing granularities of how people are talking about those issues and examining those issues. To give you a very simple example, um, when I first started learning about higher education studies like a decade ago, when we read in an empirical study about universities, the universities normally refer to American universities, American research universities. But now, when we look at empirical studies, and then we're seeing like people are more specifying what type of universities we're looking at. And, um, and also in, it, it applies the same to academics, students. We're seeing increasing research about the previously very much minoritized and not very much heard about groups or communities experiences, for instance, are people with disabilities or people from LGBTQ communities and their experiences within higher education. And what's more importantly is that there's some growing research about the intersectional features 
of the different forms of inequalities and injustice. So previously, if we look at, for instance, college admission, there may be exam examinations about socioeconomic backgrounds or classes and how they create the different uh, inequalities in admission. However, with the growing awareness that the people have different identities and multiple identities can multiply into intersectional injustice or there are different dimensions of privileges and disadvantages that at play at the same time. Um, so we're seeing like more nuanced understandings and unpacking of, for instance, uh, black women students experiences. And that um, correspond with the rise of, you know, different schools of thoughts and social movements as well, including, um, like race, uh, sorry, including like um, the intersection, intersectional research about anti-racism, anti-coloniality, and feminist research, or the intersectional research about uh, the um, about racial capitalism, etc. So these kind of intersectional research or lenses look at the different the component of different power structures that shape uh, different layers and different levels of privileges and disadvantages uh, that operate within higher education institutions and higher education settings that are influencing people who are within higher education settings. Um, and then the next thing is that um, when we are talking about increasing intersectionality or the increasing granularity, is that a good thing? Well, it's a no. So it's a good thing that we're hearing more about the much more marginalized groups' experiences, but then there, there are also risks. So for instance, there's a risk of inadvertently fostering a hierarchy of oppression or when people are being this or is thinking about this as as if it's a competition of who are most disadvantaged against and that may risk leading us into a competition of against each other among those who are already disadvantaged and then there's another risk um, of some of the oppressed groups being much more pronounced or heard than others and then there's another risk of you know, because of the increased granularity and cross-categorical understandings, um, research about those topics could be trapped into silos that were not considered or perceived as quote-unquote mainstream research. And researchers who are doing such research often are those who are from those already marginalized groups or disadvantaged groups. Then they also risk being trapped into certain silos outside the quote-unquote mainstream. They also often show the, the burden, the emotional labor, the, uh, the burden of having to fight the fight multiple times because of the multiple layers of in, in, inequity and injustice. And what is sad about that is not all their voices have been heard or recognized or valued. Um, so that's about like the increasing trend of being seeing more differences, divergence. But then another trend is about commonality. Um, there's one thing that we all share in common for everyone sitting in this room, that we're all human beings. This may sound really obvious, and you, you, you must have all experienced those times when you were like asked to check your humanity uh, on a verb side or to click whether you're a human being. Yes, of course we are. Um, this is a very simple and straightforward answer. However, um, there are, unfortunately, different forms of dehumanization that's been happening throughout the history and different symptoms of dehumanization. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. Um, so this can happen under racism, coloniality, 
sexism, capitalism, ableism, ageism, and neoliberalism. For instance, we are talking about international students as cash calls under neoliberal discourses. That's a form of objectifying students. When we are seeing researchers as only part of a clock, uh, a clock as part of a, you know, the huge science machine, it's again another form of objectification. When we are uh, reducing individuals' identities into representations of their citizenship or not nations uh, amid the geopolitical tensions, then that's another way of how the dehumanization process can hinder international collaborations, international mobilities. Um, and then the dehumanization also happens in some of the ways of doing research when some people perceive research participants as research subjects or in the kind of the colonial or unequal international research collaborations when researchers or participants from the majority world are exploited uh, through the research process. Um, so all of them are systematic as well as can happen at the individual levels. But it's not my intention to give you a very gloomy picture today to end today. So um, I will share also some examples of the emerging trends of rehumanization encounter of the dehumanization we've just discussed. Um, and those changes, they do not always share the same kind of terminologies, but they are happening in the kind of similar directions. So for instance, there's the growing body of research that seeks to recognize explore and celebrate human diversity. And they also underscore the shared aspects of our humanity and reiterating equity and justice as not merely academic concepts, but also fundamental human rights. And there's more attention on the agency of people within the systems and more focus on people's development, which have, have been much discussed in today's keynote uh, and presentations. Um, for instance, the study is about agency of students as active learners rather than passive knowledge recipients, um, or the perceptions of researchers as active knowledge agents with the autonomy to generate knowledge within research ecosystem rather than just being a piece of law in a giant science machine. There are also growing research about some aspect of the key relations that involve human, like the relationship between human and human, uh, relationship between human and technology, relationship between human and nature and environment when we talk about sustainability, et cetera. And then there's also a growing number of research about well-being, physical and psychological well-being, and mental health issues, and particularly during and post-pandemic time. And we again realize that human beings as human beings, we all share vulnerabilities. And then there are also more research about human values and affective dimensions, even when we're talking about national politics or geopolitics. Some of the nations or institutions can be personalized and analyzed through an affective dimension. And then in terms of research methodology, it's also changing um, with more embracement of ethical approaches to how we engage with different groups, particularly minoritized groups. So there's trends from researching on certain people to researching with those communities. And also there are more reflections from the research communities about the positionalities, the, the embodied privileges and disadvantages that we carry with us when doing the research. And those all help us to re re recognize and understand and appreciate the shared huma humanity that we all have. So looking into the future, it might be helpful to, for us to find a fine balance between both acknowledging the differences uh, and different types of inequalities and injustice, as well as finding common grounds. And it will be helpful for us to also have meta thinking skills or the need to step outside our immediate environment or the um, granularities 
that we're most familiar with, so that we avoid we could avoid cementing ourselves into certain silos. But perhaps not everyone would have the capacity or the time or energy or willingness to do that. So this may be the space where meta research or research on research could also make a contribution to. And we also need dialogues across different research fields, different cultures, because a lot of the things that we're talking about in higher education studies have already been long discussed and talked about in other fields of research and other fields of knowledge. And finally, as people, all of us who are engaging in higher education research, regardless of our own identities or institutional hats or everything, it might be helpful for us to acknowledge our shared humanity strengths and vulnerabilities that we all share and to embrace complexity and diversity and also to engage with empathy and commitment for a more just and equitable future in general. Thank you. Well done, everyone. And so we've got precarity and economic labor and power. We've got technology and power. We've got geopolitics and power. And we've got intersectionality, hierarchy in various forms and power. So power seems to be a constant interest we all have in the field. And thinking about power and education might be a way to think forward in there. Now, we've got a few minutes. Um, and we're not going to go into breakout groups for those few minutes. <laughs> uh, we're going to have continuing plenary, so it would be wonderful if uh, you wanted to come forward at this stage and say a couple of things. We're going to close in seven minutes, so David will take the chair at that point. Um, and, uh, but before then, please feel free to come forward. Do I see? Yes, I see a hand up there, and I see another one there. Yeah, you're first. Um, thank you so much for the great conference today. It's been very enlightening. Um, and to be able to go to the breakout groups and learn from everyone else, um, that is really crucial because we're only going to learn by community learning. Cool. Um, so my name is Aslan. Um, I'm a technology scientist and an actor currently working on integrating um, quantum computing, AI, um, and DARQ technologies for a free universal healthcare. Um, because we have the technology, and as you know, healthcare cannot be privatized because in a privatized model, there has to be somebody ill for the profits to be generated for it to work. So um, our free universal healthcare model um, so is on the right tracks. Um, just had a healthcare hackathon with UCL. We, I collaborated, so I'm from Northumbria University. I've teamed up with a UCL um, postgrad students and also NHS practitioners on utilizing new um, AI tools integrated with quantum because as we all know politics is so rubbish they we all know like I've been to so many com uh, committee in NHS all these meetings and the problem is they don't know the technology exists so they are afraid of it like you were saying they are afraid of it and because they don't know it can help in advancing research, for example, an AI tool called Consensus, right? Instead of uh, spending weeks on trying to find a research paper that is latest on cancer research, nanotechnology, because it exists, people have already done it, but we don't, they don't know the tools that they can just quickly go to ChatGPT and actually click integrate with Consensus so that ChatGPT doesn't talk rubbish. You actually now use an AI to speak to another AI and give you specific uh, research latest on nanotechnology, emerging technology for cancer research, and, other, and many other research that you can use, um, and then get yourself a head start. And you're like, oh, now we know. So now we can try to try this, try that, try that. And integrating uh, AI with quantum is where we should now focus our higher education, because UK 
is actually quite behind. <laughs> I grew up in Japan, uh, and they have two quantum computers. Um, they have, actually, they have three. Well, they have three, and their fourth one is coming. Yeah, this is a question. So how, how can we um, get um, our own university quantum computer? I know we've got simulators. Uh, Tokyo University collaborated with IBM. So they can actually now run chemistry experiments, right? Instead of wasting years of research and money, you can now test it in the computer quickly um, and see, okay, will that pro uh, protein, yeah, two minutes, thank you. Will that, will that, <laughs> will that, will that, will that uh, let's say, a new catalyst that a PhD student uh, have, has given, will it work? Uh, we can test it on now on Microsoft Azure, test it, uh, and if it does work, then we can go forward. So it's about also updating the curriculum because my university just acknowledged that I know more tech than the entire country's national curriculum. So they let me teach the student. They were like, you know what, Aslan, just be the teacher. And, and, and I enjoyed even teaching the lecturer. And the same thing with UCL again. Like, they were like, wow, the stuff that you said. Uh, so we need to be able to, and speaking to UCL, even uh, lecturers that manage programs, they said, Aslan, We've got the problem is policy. Speak, so but, yeah, I know. I, the problem is policy, and we, and about we need to, to be able to update the policy. Yeah. We need to, it's outdated. Yeah, let's update the policy, guys. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think Catherine Montgomery wanted to say something too, so let's bring her in. Yeah, um, I, I just want to ask the panel um, a slightly adapted version of the what advice have you got for your younger self? What advice have you got for the older colleagues? Um, <laughs> I, I feel I can own that term. So uh, what advice would you give us oldies about doing something different? <laughs> Older colleagues are shameless that uh, collecting ideas from others is the... <laughs> Well, I think that that's an invitation for, for, for the panel to respond, and I think that'll be the close. So let's quickly do that. Um, okay. Aline. Yeah, I'd say if you're in a, in a senior position, it's a position of privilege, and if you can, uh, I, I'd recommend you try and use it to ensure that, you know, uh, working conditions don't keep deteriorating, because I think that's what's happening. And uh, there are ways of doing that, which means that maybe they're not the best ways to advance in a career, okay? Uh, it means maybe slower scholarship, for example. Um, it means not resorting to kind of, you know, cheap labor. It means making sure that opportunities for the career researchers are real opportunities. And all those things take time. It means advocating as well at the local level, um, departmental level, university level, and it is exhausting, I know, but I think it's, it's those who are in those positions who are best positioned to, uh, yeah, to take on those challenges. Thanks, Elaine. We have reached um, quarter to six, so perhaps we'll stop there. Um, can, I, can I invite Sorry. David to... Can I add just one yeah, sentence, okay. please? Um, so thank you, Catherine, for your question. Maybe if we want to change the positions, uh, it's not advice, but for people in a senior position, it might be imagining your younger self and then be the senior colleagues that your younger self would like to or hope to work with. And then that may be, I mean, different people have different versions, but that may be one way of thinking about that. Thank you. I'd like you to thank the panel. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to invite David Mills onto the stage. David becomes the director of CG on the 30th of April, but he has already taken on the role of director in that he has put forward the bid to ESRC to give CG legacy centre status, which is going to be very important uh, in the next stage. David. Brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, it's been a great day as ever. Um, this is where it all started eight years ago. Um, I found this on our archive. Our website has an amazing set of resources. So if you go back eight years, um, you can see there's some photos from the first conference. Um, not a day older and um, equally eloquent and, and powerful. 
So, um, where have we got to since then? Well, um, I had to re re repurpose that globe as, as CG on a roll. Um, this is, you know, I don't, it's much more than numbers. Of course, it's about much more than numbers, but we've done an awful lot. Um, and the very fact that we're all here today on the ninth conference, it's all testament very much to what Simon's got going. Um, and everyone who's been part of this community, together we've created, I think everyone's you know, agreed in the room, a, a, a new international community of scholarship. And we all want to see it thrive. So it's, you know, it's a real honor to be taking this forward. Um, there's, a, there's a real sense of, of collective commitment. I, I, I can feel it, and that's, you know, I'm sure it's going to carry on. Um, the one challenge, of course, is that um, <laughs> how, possibly do I, how possibly do I do that to keep up with Simon? Um, but, well, I won't be alone, of course, because there's an amazing group of people community um, within the RMC, that we, many of whom will carry on within the new leadership group. Um, we have got a few changes, but there are lots of things that will carry on and do the same. And I think, you know, most importantly, um, doing, doing, doing the work of, of ensuring that our research does speak to policy. I mean, that was a purpose right from the start. And I think the ESRC legacy funding, which won't be very much, um, you know, people have talked about a sixpence all day today, and it really will be a sixpence <laughs> for a while. It's going to be a, a, a shoestring global community, but that, that is possible. And I think the webinar is, is not expensive to run, and I think it really enabled us to keep together and keep our a weekly sense of there being a space here for everyone to come and talk, and anyone can ask questions from anywhere. So that feels really important to me. Um, we, we, we want to sort of try and ensure that the existing projects continue to have impact. There was so much insights and learning here today and I think you know, it's clear that there's more to do to, to turn those into policy briefings to, to ensure that policy makers are in the conversation in the room and we're going to um, welcome new members like uh, Chris Millward from Birmingham who will um, join, will join um, the exec as well and I think having that sort of policy expertise but not just from the UK I'm very keen to have um, people from, from Africa, from South Asia as well just so that we really can, can begin to work on this, this real challenge of, of um, being a, a, a global community. Um, we've talked a lot at the end here now about ECRs. I do think that's a real, a real challenge for us um, to, to really think about the future and how we support them. We've talked a lot about the challenges of doing equitable global research from elite institutions in the global north. You know, as Aline and uh, Alice have both said, that's, that, that, that really poses a challenge for how we think about research. We've got some unlearning to do, absolutely. But I think we have a community that's going to help us with that. Um, so at that level, um, I think the future, even if it is on a sixpence, is, is looking pretty good. Um, and then that's thanks to Simon and, and to all of you. But now I, I want to end with one, um, one final thought, okay? Because um, as the world changes, we, you know, Simon reminded us this morning we need to keep the long view. We've been working in the 3,000 year tradition of cultural formation. So this is one scholar you might not have heard of. This is Matteo Ricci. He's a, a Jesuit priest who establishes the first Christian mission in China. He was a cultural diplomat. He brought, um, he brought his maps with him. He learned classical Chinese. He learned um, and script as well. And at the Emperor's request in 1602, he created a, a very unusual map working with um, Zhong Wentao and the astronomer um, <coughs> Zhu Zhao. And it was a map that was the first map to combine Chinese and European cartography. It was called the map of the 10,000 countries of the earth. Kunyu Guangu Guantu. It's the oldest surviving map in Chinese to show the Americas. It's block printed on six panels, each two feet by six feet. Um, it's annotated with vivid descriptions of the continents. There are only six examples left. And this is it. Okay. Um, and if you, get up, if you get up close to you, you'd see there's amazing Chinese characters um, everywhere. And it's describing the world, describing the polar attributes. There's tributes to the emperors. There's um, lunar charts. There's tables... Um, with scientific um, data in them. And Ricky has added a note in the middle of the, um, in the map, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And he writes, Once I thought learning was a multifold experience, and I wouldn't refuse to travel 10,000 miles to question wise men and visit celebrated countries. But how long is a man's life? Many years are needed to acquire complete science based on a vast number of observations. One becomes old without time to make use of this science. It's a painful thing. That's why I put great store by maps and by history. History for fixing observations and maps for handing them on to future generations. Now, Simon, I think you've helped all of us realize that we need to develop new maps of higher education. And, and for that, we're really, truly really grateful. 
And so the RMC got together and we couldn't afford to buy one of these six excellent examples because um, they've been known as the black tulips of the cartographic world. Because they, you know, they went, you know, they're so rare and so precious. So we, we got a print made and... Um, Simon, this is for you. Non-commercial use. Of course. Secrets are okay. So the final thing today, today is I don't know if you realise, but the choreography today, as ever, has been brilliant, hasn't it? It's just been amazing. And um, Claire Callender, who um, is a, you know amazing deputy director, but she's also from a, a theatrical family which takes production very, very seriously. And so you know, I want to say a big thank you to Claire, but also to Emily and to Chris and Maria who have organised this impeccably. I mean, it, it's just gone so well. Uh, and of course, all our speakers and to all of you who stayed. Um, but we're, we're particularly grateful to all our organisers. And so, Lee, who's disappeared backstage, <laughs> has come with some flowers for all of them. So, um, can we have a round of applause for all of them? Thank you.